it's all it can be used for a launch thing. And we're going down in basically the garage. So those are guns, it's not related to the site? No. They're all over. I was wondering if there was an airship. Please stay on board and don't move until we come to a complete halt. Step up off over here, watch your step up. So it has mage on it. The salt tree of 72, this was allowed to be kept as a museum type area. Now, I've been a volunteer here since about 2001. I was former Air Force. So there are things about this I really don't know as well as the other people who are true vets. So if I kind of mumble a little bit or say I don't know and I'll try to tell you that, it's because I really don't. Okay, but this place, when it started to be reconditioned, if you will, was about 1990, a military collector's group started the restoration. There are stories about how deep the water was. Some people say it was just barely up on the floor. Some say it was pit. Others say they knew it was almost a black line. But they had to pump the water out to even start reconditioning it. There weren't any missiles left down here, but anything that's molded to the floor probably was underwater at one time. So all the equipment had to be taken apart by these guys, cleaned up, put back together before it worked. The launcher itself, going up as you say, that's the only one because they were able to find enough cables and everything be able to do the job. This was in A Magazine. There were like six missiles down here, which there are now. But this site, present time, we keep this missile easily on the elevator. <coughs> Although it does get wet, because the doors don't really seal up when they close. They do leak a little bit. But to give ourselves a little bit of room to move. And people, the, one of the questions I always wonder, how did the guys handle it? There were seven guys working in the pit. And they had to move these missiles around. So it's kind of like a little game we used to have as older people, the little numbers and moving them all around to get them finally in line. Well, you had to figure out which missile you wanted and which launcher so you know which one to send up at the time. But you move a launch missile over under the elevator here, goes up and rolls back out. And there was three other launchers up there. There's two over here on this side. And there was one over here. So you could have four missiles up and actually vertical if you were back then, ready to go if you were on high alert, if you were the hot battery. Each battery location, defense location, had a site that was up and ready and ready to go within a couple minutes notice, no matter what, okay, throughout its lifespan. There was like 40 of them around the nation. There were up to two, about almost 300 sites completed before the salt treaty started fading them out and destroying them. So there were a lot of sites. Each site represented on missile. In the Bay Area, if it wasn't mentioned up here, there were about 96 missiles on alert at the time it was being phased out. That's a lot of missiles. But each site could only launch one missile at a time. That was part of the cost of this thing. You had to have so many personnel, somewhere in 180 to 220, depending on where you were and how many sites you had, personnel working on these sites to maintain them okay, and be ready to launch. So that was a lot of people. And each site had, have, had included the radar people and stuff, but each site had its own radar location. So one missile at a time from here to its target, then you could launch another one. So this site had six here, and right up on the other side of the uh, asphalt out there is another six. So you had 12 shots, one at a time. No other defense, unless they went in real high notice, and then I think they used to bring in some, uh, just went blank, and it's where you, you worked, right? The, uh, what's the name of the missile again, sorry. The kind of missile, the uh, Hawk missiles. Yeah, they brought in Hawk missiles as extra defense for the site. But you didn't get out there. As we say out here, kind of kidding me, if these missiles didn't take out the bombers that were coming from Russia, which they presumed to be the, the Russian bear bombers, before they got here, the last real line of defense was going to be you and your neighbor on the roof with your 30, your carbine and stuff. And the reason we wanted to get these guys 
go out and take them out, even though a lot of people didn't like the idea they carried nuclear warheads, is because they, those bombers coming over had megaton weapons, and we didn't like the idea that maybe San Francisco would be raiding down in Oakland if they got here, you know, that kind of thing. So these did have capability of nuclear weapons. The weapon resides from here and here. 1,300-pound weapon. It had a capability, the largest nuclear yield they could have was about 40 kilograms. About two and a half times the power released in Hiroshima. Okay? They had a smaller one that was 20, then a two, or they could have 1,300 pounds of high explosive, like HC type explosive in here, for real close. Each missile had it on board and ready to go. He mentioned upstairs that you never were down here if you were working. You had minimum two people always down here, never less than two, who knew, knew exactly what the other person's doing. Maybe more. But if a hat was off, something happened and went over there, we all go over there and pick it up, then we come back. I don't stand here and watch you do it. Because now I maybe I can reach in there and do something that I shouldn't have. So you want to make sure nobody had a chance to mess with a nuclear weapon. A lot of people say, okay, you roll these things around. How hard are they to roll? The young man there is hand his pocket. I'm going to come here, and I see a guy right here. And maybe you. The three of you, come over here, please. Yeah. Okay. Let's put our hands under here. Put our hands under here. You want help? Okay, please hand on there and pull it toward you. Pull it toward you. Pull it towards me. This way. Come here. There you go. There's my missile handlers. Now we'll push it back just a little bit. And that's only, that's pretty good right now. That's 6,000 pounds probably. They're about 10,000 pounds when they're fully loaded. But two guys would roll that missile over onto the launcher, send the launcher up, and there'd probably be two guys up above then run them out to the launchers, put them out there if they weren't already up and on alert. And then they have two backup that they can roll back on here, send them down. And when the missile launches, this unit here underneath is called a handling rail is left behind, okay? And it can be pushed out of sight. So this missile, as he mentioned upstairs, when it launches, that booster, there's 270,000 pounds of thrust, gets real noisy, real fast, slides it right off of here, because it's already vertical, and before it reaches its length, it's now broke the sound barrier. So between the, 100, the 150 decibels and all the concussions going on, you can't be around in the way of the launch. Huh? Where's the booster? The booster we call is the greenies part, or back here, four solid rocket motors. All burn at the same time, 65,000 pounds of thrust each, 270,000 pounds total for three and a half seconds. Ground to 4,000 feet in three and a half seconds. A little better than the dragsters you see going on the tracks. Okay. The, then the uh, engine within the second stage solid booster motor has another 30 seconds of burn take you up to a maximum of 150,000 feet over the top, burning, get up to a speed greater than Mach 2.65, even if it runs out and you're so high up and moving so fast, you get to a target 90 to 100 miles away from here. So, so the second stage is built right into... This is the second stage, right here. Right, there. right. So your first stage is your booster, the second stage is your continuation. Just like a rocket. What was the fuel? Fuel is solid propellant. I want can't give you the exact mixtures, but solid propellant. 